you've gone on to like Amazon, try to find something. It's overwhelming. Hey, welcome back. So last episode, we talked about boundaries and why kids behave. And if you haven't gotten the chance, please go ahead and check it out. It's a great episode. In this episode, we talked to Jennifer Warren, who is a teacher, and she has a bachelor degree in child development and a minor in psychology from Chico State and over 35 years of experience. So we focused more on the practical tips. You can hear how to set boundaries in your house versus school. We also talked about what to do in our quality time with our kids, how to prioritize the activities we can do because we are busy parents, we can't do it all. And we also talked about is sharing really caring and where is it good time to actually require this sharing with other kids. And last thing we talked about what to do with all the toys we have in the house. I bet you also have tons of them and I'm not sure how much of it is really in use. So grab a pen and a pencil or your cell phone because there are so many tips in this episode. Let's give the music its place and get started. Welcome to the Playground Talks podcast, a podcast for busy parents who want to own their parenting style and develop a stronger sense of how to handle challenging situations. I am Tammy Afriat, your host and the mother of three. In this podcast, I will interview psychologists, practitioners, behavioral therapists, teachers, and other experts about topics that bother all of us as parents so you can get both the parenting principles and practical aspects that resonate with you give you confidence and joy. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm doing <laughs> Could be that we are having uh, just the same timing. <laughs> yes, that's the story of Zoom, huh? Oh, yes, that's totally what it is. Jen, I know you have a lot of experience, so please tell us, where do you work now? I'm actually in a toddler classroom. So my classroom is 18 to 36 months, but I did 25 years of three to five-year-olds and that's preschool. And then I plopped down to toddlers for a change of scenery and fell in love. Wow, that's a lot of experience. So based on your experience and knowledge, can you please share with us what's the difference between setting boundaries in class and at home? I feel like especially nowadays, many of the strategies that maybe my parents used, like punishment, are not as popular today and there are different approaches. So I would like to hear your perspective about setting boundaries in class and at home. Well, there's definitely a difference, yes. But depending on the child's developmental level, there's different ways to respond. But I think that it's really important that teachers respect the parents' ways and know that if they do it different at home, it's okay to have different rules at school. So the parent should know that you aren't trying to change their way per se. But I also think that it's really important to tell the child. So if a child is saying, well, my mom lets me walk around with food at home, but not at school, we say it's okay at your house, but at school, it's not safe. It, you could choke and I'm worried about your safety. So it's okay to validate that. And and they may even be mad, the child, and you would say, that makes you mad that you can't walk around with your snack. And when you're ready, you can come sit down and have your snack. I believe a lot of talking and validating a child side, because they might not get all that verbal at home, maybe. So teachers can expand it a little bit. Young children's limits should be short and easy to understand. And older children, can, they can understand the logical consequences with more details. So you just want to not talk too much to a toddler. Keep it short and simple. Setting limits tells a child, I care about you and I want you to be safe. So your job as a parent or a teacher is to show them the, like, the railing of the bridge, the boundaries. And it's their job as a child, quote job, to push them and see how far the railing goes. So that's what they're supposed to do. Those railings provide a sense of security, but there's a fine line not to be too rigid because you'll get some consequences. And then it will, it will overwhelm them that there's too many rules. It's overwhelming. And also every parent and teacher has a different tolerance or comfort level of a certain behavior. So if some parents might feel nervous about their child jumping off a tree branch onto the ground, and maybe from their own childhood of getting hurt, or they're nervous, they don't want to take their child to the doctor. So it just kind of depends on 
your own gut. But as a teacher, on the other hand, the teacher knows that children need to experience things to grow and develop self-confidence. And so we can set up an area that's safe with a mat and a jumping ladder or we do jumping pillows. And a child may say, I'm not allowed to jump at home. My mom said no. And we say, it's okay to have different rules. And at school, we're safe and we have a mat and we're watching you. And so we want you to practice and trust yourself. So we want children to like know inside that they can do it instead of being told you can't, you can't, you can't. And so developing that self-confidence helps a lot. If they get hurt, like a teacher on the other hand can say, it's good to challenge yourself, but maybe it's not comfortable for your mom and you can do it at school. So you just kind of have to read the family, but you can also talk about it with the parent and saying, Johnny likes to jump at school and we know that jumping at home is harder. So we're letting you know that he's going to practice at school, that communicating is really important for that. Another example would be like a rule from home. And this is, this happens all the time with the walking around with the food and snack or snacks and we don't at school. Sometimes parents are tired and they picked up all their children and they come home and they're just happy. Their child's happy and eating and they might have different levels of children or ages and they may not have adult support to help them. And they're just so respecting that their home life might be a little different than school life where I have a team of teachers and the ratio is one to four, one to three. So it just kind of respecting the home and validating that it can be different. The other thing is about boundaries is that following through with your role, consistency, it's huge. So if you say you need to sit at the table, you can't let them walk around tomorrow with the food. Every day is the same. And and we do that at school. And and I know it's harder as a parent because I am one and I've done it. And, and you'll cave once in a while and then you can go back and say, I made a mistake but the food has to stay at the table or something like that. So it's okay to make mistakes too. Um, but validating, and even like a preschooler may tell you that they do it at home all the time and you can say that's fine, but at school, this is the rule. So you can have two sets of rules and they learn really quickly. Toddlers even, they know they don't even push our buttons sometimes, you know, and the mom is like, he's never used a fork. And we're like, oh, okay. So um, it's, it can be done, but talking and, and respecting the family life also is really important. And, and different cultures have different ways of doing things too. So yeah, that's a little bit about boundaries. Well, that was a lot. First, I get that setting boundaries is actually talking about the expectation. So this yep. is what makes the container. And then mm-hmm. you want to explain the why, and you mentioned, especially with the little ones to do it in a really short and simple way, not talking too much. So the yep. next question I want to ask you, if let's say that the kids is pushing the boundaries, how would you recommend to react and respond to that? Great question. When a child is pushing the boundaries or limits, then they're doing, quote, their job. And it's our job to continue to put the boundary on. But when responding, you can ask yourself, is this a safety concern? Always go with your gut if it's a safety concern, well, no matter what. If it's not a safety concern and you believe you need to change the behavior, start by saying or stating to the child what you want them to do to change the behavior. For example, if a child throws a toy in the house, you could say, you throw a ball outside, I'll go with you, let's go find a fall. The children respond to the positive better than the negative. So instead of saying no, don't throw that ball. Say, let's go throw outside where it's safer. So you're just kind of reframing it into a positive statement and giving the reason. So you can give the reason for your directions. It's not safe. It will break a window. It helps them understand. So the child may say, okay, let's go outside then. Or they may be mad and not like it and want, want to go outside. And you can say, it looks like you're mad. That's okay. But when you're ready, we can go outside and throw balls. So you're validating his feelings, but also still saying it in a positive way and that you're willing to help. Consistency is the key. So every day that he throws a ball inside, you say the same thing. Um, That if you say you're not allowed to play with scissors today, but yesterday the child was allowed, it's very confusing. So uh, I just want to say the same thing every day. And the other clincher to that is 
if you have two parents in the household, you want them to be on the same page. So daddy doesn't throw balls and mommy does or something like that. And also if there's extended family, older siblings or grandparents, all ball throwing goes outside. And, you know, no one's perfect. Everyone makes mistakes. But consistency is the key. Communication is key. (laughs) I I do like your point because you said just when we face a behavior, a challenging moment, then we repeat again, what's the expectation? We say, what's the why? And then rather than say, don't do, don't do it, you say, let's give them another option. So it, they will not hear as much no. I, I see it as a menu in the restaurant that you can just choose. You have so many choices. So you just focus option on their interests. Focus on their interests is what you definitely helps. So we almost never say no or don't in our school, unless it's a safety concern and they're running in the street, which is never going to happen. We uh, turn it around and say, let's try this. Let's do this. How can I help you throw something that's safe? Just giving them options. And it's just, it's not a blame game. It's, you're not in trouble. You're learning. You're learning that balls are safe to throw and toys aren't. (laughs) And the other thing with behaviors you don't want Instead of telling them what you don't want, tell them what you want them to do. So if a child is throwing food off their tray, you can say, I want the food on the table or your, or you can notice that they're keeping their food on the table, but it's messy on the ground or someone will slip and fall. So we, we call those PDAs and that stands for positive descriptive acknowledgement. For example, if If someone's running and you want to avoid saying, don't run, it's negative. It's not teaching the child what you want or why. You can say, walk, please, or stay with me or hold my hand. But a PDA is one step further positive. You are so friendly to walk beside me to keep me company. So it's just turning it around into a friendly way to communicate and then acknowledging what they're doing. You're walking beside me, keeping me company and holding my hand. So PDAs are really, really important. PDAs are recommended instead of just saying good job or good boy or good girl. It's not descriptive of what they're doing. And it really, what does good really mean? It's so vague. Everybody thinks good in a different way. So we don't ever say good boy or be nice because what does nice mean? We can say be gentle or friendly, soft. So um, telling them what you want is the quote. And sometimes adults react to behavior because they've had a memory of a childhood or they just have trauma. And so it's like on knee-jerk reaction. So the adult should ask herself or himself, like, is this rule really important? Am I willing to deal with the conflicts that will occur if my child disregards this rule? Are the rules or limits reasonable, like for their age group? Are they clear enough for the child to understand at their developmental level? Do they tell your child what to do as well as what not to do? Do you apply and enforce them consistently? Do you encourage your children to set their own limits? So the older children can say, what their limits can be. They can be part of the process, even first graders, even that's totally appropriate. You're more likely to be affected if you focus on the rules that are most important to you and your values. So it, I mean, how important is it for your child to eat all their peas or wear certain clothes? Or is it more important to take issue when a child destroys a friend's toy or swears at a parent or hits or bites someone? Make your limits reasonable and follow through. If your child breaks a friend's toy or bites or hits, talk to the child about how that made the other child feel. If they're too young to talk, you can say, ouch, you bit Sam, that made him sad. Sam doesn't like it, it hurts. Instead of saying, don't bite Sam. It has more meaning when you put emotions into the equation. It's a little more concrete. So that's a little bit about if they push the boundaries, how to turn it around, make it positive, because that's their job is to push the boundaries. Makes us crazy as parents. (laughs) Well, I really like how you point out that labeling the kids, it's not an 
and helpful approach. And, and you also mentioned pick your bottle as a parent and being consistent about it. That's what I picked. That's good. Yes. You don't have to eat all your peas. <laughs> You're not going to die from that. <laughs> I think you mentioned something about sharing a toy with a friend. And that's something I hear a lot, especially with younger kids, that there is something about sharing is caring, that it's almost like a must do. And I want to ask your thought about that. That's a tough one. And it takes many, many years to learn how to share. And to be honest with you, Children three and under about that developmental age group or stage don't know how to share. And we don't make children share. In our program, and I hope other students too, is we never have a one toy out. We have multiples of the same of every single toy in our school. We don't have any singles. So there may be a time where you only have two dolls out and there are three toddlers. That happens. And so... Toddlers don't know how to share, but we talk about taking turns and waiting, and it's a learning process. So in a school setting, if there's two dolls out and a third toddler wants one, a teacher can intervene and say, it looks like you want a doll. You're waiting your turn. It's hard to wait. Should we play ball while you're waiting your turn? Talk about that a lot so they can remember. You can validate that they're sad or they're frustrated and just recognize your feelings. It's hard to wait and you're mad that there isn't another doll. What shall we do while you're waiting? Toddlers sometimes can easily be distracted. So you could offer to sing them a song while they're waiting or draw a picture. Teachers can also model language and use words to say to the child holding the doll, when you're done, Sam wants to turn with the doll. And, and that child sometimes will just go, oh, here. And sometimes say, well, they don't do it to be mean. They don't know that that child is sad. So distraction works really well with the toddlers. Older children, preschool age and older, can a teacher can get a piece of paper and say, I'm going to write your name down and we're going to make a waiting list. And then the child can go play and either the teacher or child will go get them and say, it's your turn now. So preschools and three or four and up can do that easier. And then once in a while, you could set a timer like an egg timer and tell them it's when it's their turn. We don't do that very often at our school. We want children to self-regulate. And when they're done, they're done. Sometimes the child's on a hammock for 20 minutes because they need that. You know, we can't, we don't say your turn is up. But if you're at home, sometimes you could do that. Or what else can you do? You could do a waiting list, egg timer, or you could count to 20 and say, now it's my turn. If you just have two siblings at home or something like that. It's also a good game at school for counting, just to learn your numbers and waiting. So, but validating their feelings while they're waiting can really calm the child down while they're waiting. It's hard. It's a hard skill and it's ongoing for many years. When children are at home and it's their own personal toy and they have siblings, it's usually fewer children that they're dealing with. It just looks different at home. Sometimes sharing at home is hard and it's attention seeking if there's multiple children and they're all at different age development. So sharing is challenging. Waiting lists, egg timers, offering different activities to play with can be helpful strategies at home too. So it's a little bit, it, you can't make someone share. It, it's like making someone say you're sorry when they don't feel sorry. We don't make children say sorry. We talk about how that children is sad. But we don't say, say sorry, because it means nothing to them. So sharing is kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, I also think about it as an adult. I'm not sharing my marriage ring. Right. And I don't borrow my car to every single one of my friends even. So, <laughs> so we're kind of requiring this sharing is caring thing when we are, as an adult, have sometimes our own material boundaries. Exactly. I did a workshop once where they told you to give the person next to you who you didn't know something out of your purse and they held it the whole workshop. I couldn't even focus on the workshop because I'm like, they have my phone with all my children's pictures. You know, it was like, I want it back. I want it back. It was a good lesson. Well, so definitely. Making children share, especially at, at the younger ages, is hard. And, and 
almost not fair because they don't understand. So taking turns and encouraging them to do something else while you're waiting. You you keep saying folly their feeling, which is so important. Yeah. I take it in. <laughs> oh, good. That's great. You know, you have a toddler, so it probably will help at home. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have a toddler and I'm a pretty firm one. So <laughs> it is challenging. <laughs> yes. I want to ask your perspective about something. Sure. As a parent who are busy with career and kids, we don't necessarily have the availability to spend a really quality time with our kids the whole time, even if we pick them up at four or five, whatever. And I'm wondering, what do you think would be the most important thing to focus and have a meaningful time with the kids? When you pick them up and go home for the evening? Mm-hmm. I would start by asking them if they had anything to tell you about their day and make sure you ask in an open-ended question way versus was your day good or bad? And it's just one word answer, but you can say, who did you play with today? Or how many games did you play? I just have them make a sentence out of their answer. Tell me about who you saw, who you played with. That will help bring out any feelings. Sometimes my child would say, I had a good day, but I was sad at lunch. And I'm like, why were you sad? And then the conversation grows and and just listening listening to them is huge because we are in a hustle bustle world. So when a, a parent actually actively listens to a child and then nods their head and doesn't interrupt and doesn't cook dinner, eye contact, sitting down at their level, I think it goes a long ways in that quality time. It doesn't have to be long. You know, 10 minutes of a quality book or a puzzle uninterrupted is like gold. So pick a time, turn your phone off, turn a TV off for music and just, you know, talk, read, draw, paint, fast time, even any routines count. Routines are part of our curriculum. So getting dressed, bathing and dinner, have them help, helping them makes them feel part of the household, even cleaning up especially toddlers, they like cleaning up, throwing dishes in the sink or whatever, counting the forks, involving them really makes them feel special. So just the quality time. And like I said, it doesn't have to be long, just quality. I like the idea of prioritizing the quality over the quantity. And let's say 10 minutes is a good timing. And then I can say, for example, okay, now mommy has to have another 20 minutes of work and you can you know, choose whatever again. Okay, so conversation I got was the first thing. And your parents can also implement that during bath time, dinner time, etc. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what would be the next thing you think is important to do with your kids? It just in the evening after school, mm -hmm. uh, exercising, a yoga video or taking a walk or bike. I think people need to exercise more. Children love it and it's quality and you can, you can talk, you can hold hands, you can ride a bike. I think exercising is super quality and you don't even have to go far. You can go to your mailbox and back. And you can also, if you go for a walk, you can play a game. Let's like how many rocks can you find or how many orange leaves did you see and just make it one-on-one. -on -one. And it's so hard to disconnect nowadays with phones and things. I, I think that children have to compete with that, and it's hard. I like the idea of walking with them to the mail, and even that's their role in the house. And so we get two things combined. That they feel meaningful, and we have quality time doing it together. Exactly. Children love to be in the kitchen cooking. If, if they think they're helping, just stirring something or pouring milk into it, you know, it's we do cooking in our classrooms sometimes and they love it. You can also like make Play-Doh at home with them and they can make it and then you play with the Play-Doh with them. You, you start cook, you cook it and then play with it. And it's a good quality time. It's, it's a half an hour, you know, 10 minutes to make it. So playing with it. So I got some new and uh, good things here. <laughs> Other than conversation is walk through the mail and also cook with them. Help me in the kitchen. So I guess I need to think that it will take me longer to make yes. dinner done. Oh, but yes. if I'm prepared to that, then it's totally, I can totally do it. 
going yeah. back to school and communicating with teacher. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. what is important for a parent to communicate about with his child's teacher? Oh, it's super important. I can't stress it enough. It's hard a lot. With the younger kids, there's a little more time at drop off time to communicate to a teacher. I think the public schools are a little more challenging. But nowadays we have email and you can just send an email and say, my child was up all night. Just wanted to let you know or something like that. But for us, we do a morning check-in with parents. And it's super important with the younger kids to communicate with the parents because these children can't communicate as well. They're toddlers. And so we don't always get the whole picture. So I try to ask things like, were they up all night? How did they sleep? Did they eat breakfast already or are they hungry now? What did they eat for breakfast? If sometimes I, if it's a chocolate donut, I'm sass, <laughs> you know, but it could explain some behavior if that's what they had for breakfast. So if the parent has questions or if they are wondering about my child all of a sudden doing all this drooling or there's lack of verbal sounds or there's some constant crying or sometimes, and this happens a lot, home violence, abusive boyfriends or TV exposure that's not appropriate, special need concerns, genetic health concerns, any physical concerns, locking or crawling skills or lack of. If they can have a conversation with the teacher, like, I don't know why he's drooling all night. I can watch the child all day. I can document. Maybe it's only before lunch or nap, or maybe he's getting more teeth. Maybe there's a, something that we need to call for outside services. So it gives the teacher a little more leverage in documentation if a parent has come to them first. If the parent's informed by some daily detail, they can be aware, document behaviors, explain concerns. For example, if a parent did not tell a teacher the child was up late all night and then the child cried all morning and could not participate, but the teacher didn't know, might have thought they were sick or hurt. It's hard to participate in activities when you're that tired. And so if the parent knew that, maybe she could be prepared to have a cot ready so that the child can nap in a quiet area or a little extra TLC in the rocking chair. It happens. Children are exhausted sometimes when they come to school. So it helps that the parent would have said, I was up all night. They were up all night. So nobody's happy. <laughs> so that's super important. Another example, and this was a true story. A mom's boyfriend was at the house and was abusive towards her in front of the child. The child comes to school and displays behavior that's withdrawn, sad, quiet, and unsettled and aggressive. And if the teacher did not know what happened, it would be hard to figure out how to support the child. If the teacher knew they could talk with the child and remind them that they are safe with you, it is okay to feel sad or scared. If it's an older child, the teacher can try to get them to dictate words or a story to write feelings down, talk about feelings, show pictures of feelings and emotions sing songs about feelings and emotions, reminding them that whatever they're feeling is okay. And sharing your feelings is important to teach to, so teachers can help them. That knowledge is super crucial information. So it is really important. And that extra TLC, sometimes all they need is a little extra cuddle or an extra hug here and there even. And also if there is need for outside agencies, psychological, legal, CPS, we can get the mom some support or the dad some support or the guardian, which would help the child in the long run too. The teacher can get children's books that may talk about similar situations or books about emotions. You can use puppets, flannel boards, learning through play is a great way to encourage communication and let the parent know that you are a team and work together to support the child. Some children are in childcare more than they are at home, like my school. I'm considered a primary caregiver, second to the primary parent. So it's crucial to be a team to get the child the most supportive education and TLC. So and we work with outside services a lot. So there's a lot of support if you reach out to let someone know you need. Support. So it's crucial. Can student pick what TLC stands for? Tender loving care. Tender loving care. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So little extra tender, loving care, a little extra hug goes a long way. So sometimes children, I mean, I've had to hold a child for like two hours. They just would not be let down and they were sad and crying and I didn't know why. So 
And it, it is easier nowadays. We have programs that communicate with parents. We have texting, we have email. It, it is easier to just say, my child was up all night. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you before. I'm so busy. Even that little bit goes a long ways. So it's super important. It seems like it's so important for the parents to reflect what was going on in the child's life. So you as a teacher can support the kid. And then, exactly. so now I want to hear from you what the parents should ask the teacher. What? So in my center too, we send videos and pictures home throughout the day, telling them all the great activities they participated in or are they learning in, the friends they make, using a spoon or a fork now or drinking a cup with his own hands for the younger ones or the older ones, you know, writing their letters or numbers, learning a song, just positive, 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 <laughs> how great they are. And, you know, they're not always, we, we have pair conferences. And so there's always challenging things to tell parents sometimes. And that's really hard, whether if it's a learning delay or aggressive behavior, constant biting, we try to make plans. So hopefully the plan will be done at school and at home. If it's a, a fighting thing, that's super important. We try to be on the same page. So consequences and logical consequences, and, but not negative, just logical. Try to keep those positives coming. <laughs> this is a harder world to live in, I feel like, than when I was a kid. So there's a lot of distractions. There's less verbal communication, I think. It's a lot of texting and videos and it's it's a harder time, I think, for kids. So, and even, I mean, we deal with a lot of young parents. Some of my parents, 14, 15, 18. So they're still learning too. So they need a lot of support. Wow. So we give them handouts. We give them pamphlets. We, you know, these are some things you can ask me. Oh, you know. I, I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking of myself getting, I was almost 28 when I got my first <laughs> child. And I look back and say, I didn't know that much as I know now. Yes, and now you're exactly. telling me about parents who are 14s and 15s. And I don't, it That's sounds long yeah. so challenging. Yeah, I actually have a different question for you that just came up to my mind. So I, I can see that in my house and in many friends' houses, there are so many toys that I guess 90% of them are just sitting and no one touches them ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm wondering, since you have a broad age perspective mm -hmm. from 18 mm -hmm. months to five, what would, mm -hmm. what do you think are the must have toys that each house have and the other can, we can go bye bye. Wait, we can give them away. Yes. There's a lot of toys that only have one purpose. Those are the toys I give away. Toys that have multiple purposes, like building blocks, Legos, puzzles, things that use the mind more. I like wooden toys, but not all of them have to be wooden, but there's stacking and there's sorting, there's classifying and dramatic play like dolls and stuffed animals are important. I try to stay away from things that don't teach you anything. <laughs> They're just cute, you know. Also, with the too many toy things, I think. Children get overwhelmed and they can't make a choice. So we have shelves with toys and we'll have one basket on each shelf. Not four baskets, even though four can fit, just one. Because it's it's very overwhelming. Like you've gone on to like Amazon, try to find something. It's overwhelming. There's just lots of stuff. So limiting it and open-ended activities are way more educational. Um, there's these... Plastic toys you get at like fast food restaurants. I like the open-ended where you can just create and use your imagination. So like doll houses or farms with animals dress up, then you can use your imagination. And that's really, really helpful. Writing, any kind of art, writing, sensory, anything that's just stimulating the neurons in the brain and the synapses to wake up. Like, oh, this is something new, but too many toys is overwhelming and I can't choose. That's why the whole toy box mentality is not helpful because everything is mixed in one and you have to take them all out to get to the bottom one and then who wants to put them all back never have a toy box 
like a dresser drawer <laughs> and you want the bottom t-shirt. <laughs> so too many is overwhelming. And even for, you know, up to first graders, it's just three colors of construction paper, not a whole rainbow. You can have blue, green, or red for now. And at the age, they can do more. Choice of three or less for age zero to five. So everything that developed your imagination. Yes. Like kitchen yeah. stuff, uh, putting clothes, customers, like. Yeah, kind of dress up. Mm -hmm. Wearing your mom's shoes. It's super fun. I got it. Uh, books, a lot of books, audio books, not as much videos, but audio books are really important. And it just is a different way to listen, especially with headphones. Fun. So, uh, but puzzles are an incredible learning tool also. And there's vertical puzzles, there's flat puzzles, there's floor puzzles, wooden puzzles. Well, that's a great thing to know because I think every time we move, I'm giving yeah. away more and more stuff. Or like, yeah. And it's unbelievable how much it's a lot of toys, how much know. stuff we um, get. It's really hard to say this, but for birthdays, I encourage family not to buy toys. I said clothes or donate to a charity or, you know, a picture or a card. I mean, my children were lucky they didn't need it all. So the charity thing is kind of cool in your child's name. Oh, and then also you can, if they're toys that you like, but you feel like you have too many, just box them up and rotate them every three months and it feels like a new toy again and then they'll have a longer tension span yeah you know what we had that like winter games and then for mm -hmm. the pandemic we had all the thing down <laughs> it <laughs> was never ending this time <laughs> that we spent in the house so <laughs> well we didn't learn how to be in a pandemic so i think if you survived you did great <laughs> well i'm here to talk about it if you call this survival then okay <laughs> yeah exactly. you're doing great <laughs> the hardest job in the world being a parent oh my goodness and so, it, it yeah. is challenging um this was really helpful and i want to ask you if you have anything else you would like to add i don't think so i think you had some great questions well you had some great insights <laughs> and you sure. gave a lot of food for thought and also many practical answers that I need to write this all down. So, Jen, thank you so much for being with me and have a lovely weekend. Thank you so much. <laughs>Hey, thank you so much for joining me and listening to Jennifer Warren. If you like the recap that I'm usually doing, please go ahead and text me via Instagram or the email. Everything is on the show notes, so I can go ahead and do it. And also, if you find this helpful, share it with your friend. Don't keep it to yourself so more parents can enjoy those tools. Last thing, remember to treat yourself and your kids with compassion and curiosity. Bye, see you next time.